Here we're beginning a new unit of the course. This is a unit about the concept of symmetry. Now I'm sure the word already means something to you. In this unit, of course, we're going to do a mathematical study of the idea of symmetry. And the first thing to tell you is that in mathematics, the idea of symmetry involves the idea of motion. Here is our basic definition, the one that we will use throughout this unit. We say that a figure or object or design is symmetric if we can move the figure in some way so that when we are done, the figure looks exactly the same. And in particular, it's in the same position. To illustrate this, let's look at this standard playing card. This is a queen of diamonds from a standard 52 card playing deck. And we can take this card and we can rotate it by 180 degrees about its center point, And afterwards, it will look exactly the same. In fact, let me illustrate that. Here is that card again, as you can see. And there's this nice little handle I can use in PowerPoint to rotate it. Let me take it and I will rotate it. Now notice that I'm not rotating it completely around, but only halfway. That is to say 180 degrees. And when I'm done, there's no way to tell that I have moved it at all. It looks exactly the same, despite the fact that clearly individual features have been moved. For example, the eye of the queen, which is at the top, has now moved down to the bottom, and so on. So, according to our definition, we would say that that card has rotational symmetry. In fact, to be more specific, we say that it has 180 degree rotational symmetry. Here are some other examples of objects that have rotational symmetry. The one on the right is a rather crude photograph that I took with my phone. Uh, if you know where the Garden of Numbers is on the Columbus campus, then you will actually recognize this as one of the stones that's there. That's a certain sign in mathematics. You don't need to know what that symbol means. It comes from calculus and it's called the integral sign. The reason I'm showing it to you here is because indeed, like the Queen of Diamonds, that has 180 degree rotational symmetry. Over on the left, we see a daily crossword puzzle from the New York Times. And again, and if you've never noticed this, this, this may come as an interesting observation, it has rotational symmetry. That is to say, not the words and not the numbers that go in the squares. But if you look at the pattern of black and white squares, it has rotational symmetry. That's one of the rules that must be followed if you want to make a puzzle that's going to go into the newspaper. All right, here's a different sort of symmetry. Let's consider this letter T that I'm showing you in green over on the right. We can reflect this printed letter across a vertical line, and afterwards it will look exactly the same. Now, when I say we can reflect it, what am I saying we can do? Let's suppose that we had that green letter T cut out of a piece of green paper. We could pick that up, turn it over, and set it back down again. It would now be upside down as far as the sheet of paper is concerned, but it would look exactly the same. We couldn't actually tell that we had done that. And therefore, we say that this printed letter has reflection symmetry. Although I just described that idea of reflection as something that we did by picking up the paper and putting it back down, another way to think about reflection is as something that we actually carry out inside the plane itself. So let me take that same example and let me begin to uh, point at some of the uh, parts of the figure here and explain how I'm thinking of reflection as something that's carried out within the plane itself. That again. For example, let's consider the top right corner point, the one I'm circling right there. Now, if we reflect across the vertical axis, which I've indicated here, this thick vertical line, where will that point go? Well, we're working here in a grid, so we can count very carefully. We can see 
that we are one, two, three, four squares directly to the right of the vertical axis. So what we need to do to reflect is we actually need to start at that point and then we need to move to the left. Let me show you that. So I go like this. I hit the, the axis of reflection, as we call it, and then we continue to go four more squares. We go the same distance past the axis that we did in going to it, and there's the point where we should end up. So let me indicate that point. There is the image point. So we say, given this original point, when we reflect it, here is the image point over here that's shown on the left. And we can think about doing that to every single point of the figure. Let me take another one. Let me take this bottom right corner. This time we're only one square to the right, so we move to the left by one, and then we move another, and here is the image point of that one. Okay, so point by point we can think that we are applying this motion called the reflection, which takes points on the right of the axis over to points on the left, and preserves the distance from that line. For a reflection there is a line called its axis. In this particular example, this is a vertical axis. We can also have a horizontal axis and we can even have axes which are diagonal or oblique. In any case, looking again at this letter T, as we've said, it's possible to reflect it across a vertical line, and therefore we say that this letter has reflection symmetry. Now here's another example. Human faces are very close to being symmetric. Some people have extremely symmetric faces, other people maybe not quite so much, but we see this feature in, really in everyone. Everyone has a great deal of symmetry. Here is President Obama, and as we can see, his features are extremely symmetric. Just to illustrate that, I've done something. Here's a little game you might want to play. One of these is a photograph of the President, Barack Obama. And the other one is what I've obtained by taking that photograph and reflecting it across a vertical axis. Now both of these look like a person smiling at us. One of them is what we actually see, and the other one is only what he sees of himself when he looks in the mirror. Which one is which? Well, I actually had to pause the lectures and cheat and go look up the answer because I had forgotten. And the answer is it's the actual photograph of Obama on the left and the one on the right is the mirror image. But as you can see, he looks very similar in both of those. We immediately recognize those as a photograph of the president. And in fact, if I weren't playing this game with you, I think you would be totally convinced that it was an undoctored photograph of him shown on the right. It's also possible to have objects that have both sorts of symmetry. And here I give you three examples. One again is from the Garden of Numbers on the Ohio State campus. That's the letter uh, O. As you can see, it has reflection symmetry with a vertical axis. It also has reflection symmetry with a horizontal axis. And it has 180 degree rotational symmetry. Everything I've said about that is also true of that infinity symbol. Again, that's taken from the Garden of Numbers. And this is a symbol in mathematics that has two reflection symmetries with horizontal and vertical axes, and also 180 degree rotational symmetry. Finally, we come to the starfish, and it's a beautiful looking symmetric object. In fact, it has five different axes of symmetry, and it has rotational symmetry, but not now through 180 degrees, but actually through a smaller angle of 72 degrees. It's like people roughly symmetric. It's also possible to have three-dimensional objects that have symmetry. Here is a three-dimensional object called a dodecahedron, and it has many symmetries.
For example, there are axes that go through opposite faces. Take, for example, the light blue one on the top. There's an opposite face, which is hidden. But you can take a line that goes through the center of those two faces, and then you can rotate the entire dodecahedron, but not a full 360. In fact, again, just 72 degrees. And when you're done, the dodecahedron will look exactly the same, except perhaps for the way the faces are colored. There are also our reflection symmetries across planes. What I'm saying is that we can cut this with a plane so that it would look exactly as if it were being reflected through a mirror. Now, those are all very interesting, but in fact, they're so complicated. This study of three-dimensional symmetry is so complicated that in this unit, we're not going to look at anything in three dimensions. We're going to stick purely to symmetry of two-dimensional objects.